All right, let's be getting inside. We're going to be uh, continuing with our next session. I want to take a minute. I know that some of you were here uh, the other night when we announced the book, but if you weren't, I just want to say a few things about the book. We have a brand new book out. It's, it's 28 questions that young kids are asking and the answers for them. Uh, but parents want to know, too. That's the thing. Uh, the way we acquire these questions is we, in our camps, our summer camps that we speak at, our team, we give out index cards to the kids. And we tell them, write down whatever questions or doubts you have, and uh, we will spend the week addressing those questions. Uh, and so over the years, we've accumulated quite a few of these index cards. And so we decided to... Uh, put them in a spreadsheet and figure out which are the most common questions and write a book answering those most common questions because we figure if we keep getting them at all these camps, then it's the questions young people are asking today. Uh, it's all over the place. There's so many questions and so many themes. It's not a themed book. Uh, it just deals with questions. Um, and so here are some of the questions just to give you an idea. The, obviously, the cover question is there to provoke you because that's one of the questions. Did Jesus commit suicide? And uh, at first, when I, when I heard that question the first time, I was like, where did that come from? Uh, seems so foreign to me. Uh, but uh, there's an atheist site that promotes that idea and gets people to doubt their faith because they present Jesus as a loser that committed suicide, and why would you be following him? And some young people buy into that lie and that deception, and they even abandon their faith. So it's a, we decided, well, I guess it's, that's why they're asking the question because they're running into these arguments with their friends and everything else. So uh, here's some of the questions just to give an idea. They're hard questions. These kids are asking good, hard questions. Why does God create homosexuals and then condemn them? Why is pornography wrong? How did we get so many races? What about the aliens? How do you know the difference between what is real and what is fake? Questions about Adam and Eve, questions about uh, did God use evolution, cavemen, the age of the earth. But also, you know, how do you bring up God with your friends? How do you talk to your friends about God? Uh, is it possible that Hitler got saved? That's another question. What about people who died before Jesus? What happens to kids or babies when they die? Uh, do you really think Jonah lived in a whale for three days? Uh, what if, why do my parents feel like they have to shove Christianity down my throat? Uh, is hell really forever? Uh, aren't there contradictions in the Gospels? And just on and on. Those are just some of the 28 questions. The answers are concise answers, 12 to 1,500 words. Uh, very readable. And we want you to get this for yourself, to be able to, to help your kids un, un, unpack some of these questions. But also, if you know a kid that's struggling, or you have children or grandchildren, you, you know this is something you want to put in their hands. When they read the title... They're going to want to read at least that answer. And that's going to draw them in. So, it, it, so we, we encourage you to take one or take a couple, give them as gifts. These are really good resources. And I'm not here to sell you books. We want to impact this generation. And that's why we put these resources out, so that we can impact this generation. So just an encouragement to look into that book. Let's begin with a saving truth in a world that has lost it. Jesus Christ said in John 8, 32, that you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Always look at context when you look at scripture. Context is super important. What was the context and what was Jesus talking about? What does truth set us free from? When you read John 8, and particularly the latter part of the chapter, Jesus is identifies, just a few verses later, he identifies the enemy, Satan, as a liar, as the father of all lies, as a master of deceit. He identifies him. In that context, he's telling you, if you don't want to be lied to, if you don't want to be deceived, if you want to be free from, from the snares of, of lies and manipulations, then know the truth. Know the truth. It's going to set you free from from being captive to lies of the enemy. That's the context of the, of the passage. Truth is what keeps us free from sin and from lies. We need to know the truth. 
But we live in a world that where the truth is less and less important every day. That's just the reality. In 2016, the word of the year for the Oxford English Dictionary was post-truth. Every year they pick a word based on Google searches, based on searches of their dictionary, based on a search of all the different blogs. They do an extensive research of, about what is the one word that is most prevalent in culture at any given year. And I believe they were right on the money because that is the world we're living in. We're living in a post-truth world and it hasn't gotten better since 2016. It's gotten a lot worse. So how do they define this word? Post-truth is relating to or denoting circumstances in which objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion than appeals to emotion and personal belief. That's what post-truth means. Let me highlight what's important there. Appeals to emotion and personal beliefs is more important than objective truth in our world. That's what it means to be in a post-truth world where appeals to emotion, emotions, personal preferences are more important than objective truth when you decide how to live your life and what to do. That's, that is the bottom line. Now that creates all kinds of confusion and chaos. And by the way, I love that the word of God predicted that this would be the situation in the end. Man, I'm blown away by it. It's almost as if the Apostle Paul, when he was writing to Timothy, had seen what the word of the year was for 2016, post-truth. And he explains to Timothy how this works in a powerful way. Listen, listen to what he says. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own what? Desires. What's going to be the ruling category here of decision-making? desires that's emotions that's personal preferences because they have itching ears they will heap upon themselves teachers and they will turn their ears away from what truth and what are they going to turn their ears to fables that is the definition of a post-truth world where we allow our desires to be more important and our preferences and our choices to be more important than truth when we make decisions. Paul could have written that last week and it would be just as relevant as when he wrote it. That's the, that's the power of the word of God because God knows what these times are like and he has already revealed it to us. So post-truth has now blossomed into what we know as a culture of confusion. There's confusion in a lot of categories, a lot of categories. I'm just gonna give you a few. First of all, there's confusion about freedom. Young people, you got to hear me here because this is really important. And if adults, you want to understand what's happening in our culture, why there is so much rebellion in our culture to authority, rebellion to police, rebellion to government authority, rebellion to teachers in schools, rebellion to parents in our culture. It's because of the confusion in the concept of freedom because here it is let's apply the definition here by elevating our feelings and our emotions above objective truth autonomy is confused for freedom autonomy is confused for freedom what we call freedom today is not freedom it's autonomy someone is autonomous if he's a law unto himself auto is me my i nomos is law autonomous means a law unto myself and what people consider freedom today, based on their beliefs and their preferences, is whatever they decide is the law. In other words, who sets the rules? I do. That's what real freedom is. Real freedom, in other words, is being able to do whatever I want, whenever I want, however I want. If I can't do that, then I'm not free. That's the concept. Our culture considers to freedom when you can do whatever you feel like doing. Please understand that that's not freedom. That's autonomy. And you can't live in a world like that. If everybody does whatever they feel like it, we would have nothing but chaos in our world. 
disorder. It would be impossible to live. Imagine just one scenario. Imagine if everybody drove the, however they felt like driving. I mean, you don't have to imagine too hard in some parts of Seattle. <laughs> but imagine. What's the speed limit? Whatever I feel like it. It says 30, but I don't care. I drive what I, I I'm free. I do what I want. So I'm going to drive 70 on a 30 mile. What, 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 that's a stop sign. Who cares? I stop when I want. What about the red light? I don't care. That's just a suggestion. I prefer not to stop. Can you imagine driving that way? We wouldn't be able to go anywhere. There would be accidents on every corner. Deaths galore. See, freedom is not about being able to do whatever you want. Freedom has parameters. Your freedom stops where my freedom begins. In order for you to have freedom, you have to respect my freedom. And I have to respect his freedom. And he has to respect her freedom. And we all have freedom. That's why you need laws and parameters. So that society can work well and everybody can exercise their freedom without violating the freedom of others. Autonomy doesn't make room for others because autonomy doesn't care about others because autonomy is all about me. It's just what the only thing that's important is about me. And you know what? That is, that's been the case since the Garden of Eden. This confusion about autonomy and freedom goes back to the Garden of Eden like I, like I shared with you guys when I, a while, I think on Thursday. We have been pursuing autonomy since the beginning of our race. Adam and Eve sought autonomy from God they sought to transcend the purpose for which they were made so that they could be the definers of their own purpose. And we continue that pursuit today. That's a direct quote from Abdu Murray, a good friend of mine, in a book called Saving Truth. What is he saying? What do, what do we find in the book of Genesis? You see, God said there, that you could eat from any tree except that one tree. When God did that, what did God do? He established the parameters of freedom. He established that you are free. You can eat from any of the trees you want as often as you want, but there are some rules here. The one rule is don't touch that tree over there. When the enemy tempted Eve, what did he tempt her to do? Touch the fruit that you were not supposed to touch. In other words, why don't you make up the rules? Why don't you decide what's right and wrong? Why go along with somebody else's decision? You make your own decision. You want to eat from the tree? You eat from the tree. You know that God doesn't want you to eat from it because when you do, you're going to be like him. We misunderstand that passage all the time. It's not really being like God in the sense of knowing right and wrong. It's like being like God in the sense of determining what's right and wrong. Knowing it in a way where you determine it. When you eat from that tree, you're saying, okay, I decided that this tree is good to eat from and I'm going to eat from it. Just like God decided it wasn't good. So you're going to be like God. You're going to be deciding what's right and wrong. You're going to be autonomous. They were pursuing autonomy. And, and, and to this day, so are we. That's what happened in the Garden of Eden. There's a lot of confusion about freedom. Post-truth mindset lumps together all tradition, all authority, all indoctrination. And they equate everything in a little box called coercion. In other words, if any, any tradition that tries to limit my freedom, that's coercion. Authorities trying to limit my freedom, that's coercion. You know, any type of attempt to indoctrinate me, that's coercion. And I'm going to reject it. Why do you think kids rebel against their teachers and even hit teachers today? There's teachers that have been brutally assaulted by students. Why? Because the teacher attempted to take away their freedom in their minds. Why do, why do people rebel against police officers today and against authority? Because I want to do what I, whatever I want, and I don't like for you to tell me what to do. I don't recognize your authority. I can do whatever I want. That's the message of rebellion we see. Why do kids rebel against parents today more than ever? Because who are you to tell me how to live my life? I'm going to do what I want. Because that's what the culture is promoting when you live in a post-truth world, objective truth is not important. What's important is your preferences and your emotions. Whatever you desire, you should be entitled to do it. Doesn't matter what it is. It rejects any intrusion on the pure slate of your autonomous mind. 
Nobody can tell you what to do. If each of our personal preferences is celebrated without truth as our guide, what's going to happen? Confusion. It's inevitable. When my law unto myself conflicts with another person's law unto himself, who's going to arbitrate between us? Who's going to determine which one of us is right and which one of us is wrong? What if my freedom and my autonomy leads me to hurt you? Who's to tell me that's wrong if I do what I want? We can't live this way. And yet we're trying really hard to live this way in our culture. So when you see all of that happening, it, it's going to make more sense now that you understand why it's happening. Because we've got a lot of confusion when it comes to freedom. And let me ask you the first of several rhetorical questions. Is freedom a matter of preference? Of course not. Of course not. You don't get to decide. The laws are the laws. They're established by God. And I'm talking about God's laws now. And our only response is to obey or to disobey. But we don't make it the rules. He does. He created us. He created this world. There's a lot of confusion about human dignity. There's another category of confusion. Why? Because by elevating my feelings and my emotions, here's the definition of post-truth again, above objective truth, then we can determine for ourselves which human beings have value and which don't. So is it any wonder we do abortions? But abortions is not the end of it. Peter Singer argues that human babies, after they have been born, can be killed by their parents. And Peter Singer is not some idiot standing on the corner, you know, that, that nobody listens to. No, he's a professor at Princeton University, a professor of bioethics. He's an Australian philosopher. He's got a microphone and people are listening to him. And this is his view. Why should the right of the mother end when the baby comes, is born? Parents should have the right to terminate the life of a child even, even after they're born if, if it's not convenient. That's where we're headed. We're not, it's not going to get better. We started with abortions in the first trimester. Then we made it legal in the second trimester. Recently, we made it legal in the third trimester. You, 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 many of you saw the, the headline front page New York Times picture of the Congress in New York all celebrating, applauding, smiling, and jumping up and down because they passed the law to make abortion legal in the third trimester. Meaning a mother can go into labor and, and, and the, the fountain can break and then they could terminate the baby's life. And they're celebrating that. But you see where we're, it's not getting better. The progression now is going to be to live babies. And that's where we're going. He argues that these babies are not really persons because they lack the mental capacity to value themselves. And he's teaching bioethics to the next generation. What's going to come out of there? By the way, who goes to Princeton to study bioethics? The rich people, the people that have a lot of authority, the people that will be the future governors and congressmen and leaders because there's a, there's a chain there. Go back and look at all the congressmen and all the congresswomen of most of the United States, and they're all from Ivy League schools, pretty much. There are exceptions, but most are from the Ivy Leagues. And what are they being taught in the Ivy Leagues? There you go. That's what they're being taught. The parents, according to Singer, have the capacity to assign value to the baby. Really? Since when? Since we elevate our preferences and our emotions above truth. Alberto Gubilini, he's not alone. Alberto Gubilini and Francesca Minerva are other two medical ethicists that advocate for a parent's right to kill a newborn baby with, in, if, with infirmities if it would impose a hardship on the parents. So it's born but it has a birth defect, put him down. Like you would put down an animal. Or if it's going to impose a hardship that you can't take right now and you can't handle at this moment, you decide. Parents have the autonomy to end the baby's life because they have the authority to determine whether the baby's value justifies the burden of caring for it. That's the world we're living in, a post-truth world. Abdu Murray, again, he's right on the money. He says, this is the essence of unfettered human autonomy, to become as God, but without the benefit of divine wisdom. That's it. 
Man is trying to take God's place, but man doesn't have the skill set to run this world. Man doesn't have the knowledge he needs. Man doesn't have the power he needs. Man doesn't have the moral compass he needs. So when we usurp God's throne and we take the wheel, it's an accident for sure. We're going to destroy everything. And that's what man is attempting to do. We're going to decide what lives are valuable and which ones are not. And the results are going to be horrific. All right, here we go. This one's going to... Sorry, I want to show you a, a, a debunked video we just did on the abortion issue a couple of months ago. Powerful. I want you to hear it and, and, and think about this because these are the arguments that are being made and this is a good way to refute it. If somebody wants to discuss with you abortion or the value of life or anything, this is a great video to show them. Some of you already downloaded our, our uh, sent the text to 51555 and you got the debunked videos. If you don't know what I'm talking about, I'm going to tell you how to do it in a minute. But you can have all of these videos for free on your phone to show to people. This is the one we just put out on abortion and the value of human life. All right, here we go. This one's going to be a rough journey that triggers some emotional dissonance and challenges some preconceptions. But hey, and these things got to happen to get to the truth of a matter. So warned. consider yourself warned. And now imagine you're out one day and you see someone dump a bunch of babies on the side of the road. Then you see a man with a hatchet. He walks over to the babies and starts, well, you get the picture. What would you do? Give them a thumbs up, take a selfie, assemble the Avengers, or try to stop the man right there on the spot? Now, with that in mind, I ask you these questions. What is the difference between that scene and the everyday scenario inside thousands of abortion clinics? What are the essential differences between what's in the mother's womb, the unborn, and what's outside the mother's womb, the born, that justifies the mass elimination of the former, but the collective protection of the latter? Well, to help you answer that, I present to you the SLED test. What's that you say? Well, it's this, I say. Does being a human being with human value and human rights have anything to do with our size, level of development, environment, or degree of dependency? Is a large middle-aged man more human than a smaller 14-year-old boy? Should a fully developed female be granted more human rights than an eight-year-old girl who is not as developed yet? Is someone more worthy of life if they live in a mansion in America and less worthy if they live in a shanty in Africa? Is it okay to eliminate a nursing boy, but not his six-year-old sister, simply because the nursing boy is more dependent on his mother? No, 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 and of course, no. So then the unborn isn't any less human, void of their human value and human rights, simply because of SLED, right? So now what? Well, some claim it's in the science, man. Just follow the science, they say. But when we do, it's clear from the earliest stages of development, the unborn are distinct, living, and whole human beings. In fact, the scientific evidence has been so clear for so long that even way back in 1981, a U.S. Senate report stated this. Physicians, biologists, and other scientists agree that conception marks the beginning of the life of a human being, a being that is alive and part of the human species. There is overwhelming agreement on this point in countless medical, biological, and scientific writings. Okay, now fast forward a few decades. High-res photos, 3D scans, and brilliantly detailed ultrasound help us see with our own eyes what's in a human being's womb. And guess what? It's a human being. Wow. What else would it be? A piano? A whale shark? Just common sense. So now what? Well... There are those who actually know it's a human being. It's implicit in their language, but they use emotional appeals like, he's a financial burden. I don't want it. It's an emotional drain. It's not my fault. I'm not ready. It's not fair. She'll stop my professional progress. It'll get in the way of my desires and dreams. It's cruel for an unwanted child to be in this world. The child would be a product of incest. I can do whatever I want with my child, okay? Can you use any of those to justify the killing of the born? No. So then why the unborn? Look, enough is enough. This topic might be psychologically complex, but it's certainly not morally complex. We all understand that how you feel doesn't justify what you do or get to do. I mean, think about it. Uh, Your Honor, uh, the reason I ran over those people is because they're an emotional drain. Officer, I, I know I killed those people, but if I didn't, it would have stopped my professional progress. And now, allow me to add this for good measure. When it comes to the possibility of actually hurting or killing a human being, Shouldn't we err on the side of precaution? I mean, most of you wouldn't run over a box in the middle of the road if for a second you thought there might be a puppy or a kitten in it, right? But why not go to the same lengths to save and protect human babies? Just asking. Bottom line, human beings, all human beings, from the moment of conception have value simply because they are human beings made in the image of God, period. Psalm 139.13 declares that God needed you together in your mother's womb. So precious is life that God commands us not to murder, but instead tells us to love one another and do nothing out of selfish ambition. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. The minute we think we are more valuable than others for any reason is the minute we think others are less valuable. 
And that line of thinking is the root of racism, sexism, massacres, school shootings, bullying, hatred, and all kinds of other injustices that most of us rightfully stand against because we don't want human beings to be hurt or mistreated. And that should go for the unborn too. So this idea that the unborn are less human than the born and that it's okay to eliminate them has been debunked. Adios. That's a powerful response that covers the main arguments. It's great to show something like this and then have a discussion about it. If you, do, if you weren't here the other day, here's how you get it. Send the text to 51555, and what you're going to type in the text is stay bold, space, oh, I'm sorry, we should say creation, not rise up, my bad. I, I do a special tab for every location, so yours would say creation. Stay bold, creation. You, you send that, and you're going to get a, a back a, a text that's going to tell you a link to sign up. That's a second step is really important. It's not enough just to send a text. When you get the response, fill out the little form. Put your name and your email address, and you're going to be on the list. And every time we come out with a new debunked, you're going to get it on your phone before anybody else. We send it to our debunked supporters, which are the ones on, on this number, first, before it goes out to the public. The next one coming out next week is on critical race theory. I've already seen it, and it's phenomenal. So you're going to get it next week. Plus, you'll get a link to all of our debunked videos. We have 20 of them. A lot of in really important issues. God does not exist. The Bible is full of errors and contradictions. Uh, you know, human evolution. What about fossils? All of these are debunked in three to five minute videos. You know, so I encourage you to get this and it's free. So this is a great resource. So is human dignity a matter of preference? Of course not. Objective fact is that humans are made in the image of God. And our emotions and preferences and desires don't change that. They don't override that. A human's value is not determined by us. It's determined by the fact that they're made in the image of God. There's also a lot of confusion about identity. This is a big one in our culture today. Because by elevating our feelings and our emotions above objective truth, we are free to determine our own identities. Think about that. If I want to be a woman, even though I was born male, well, guess what? I can be one. Because my, my preferences are more important then truth, then science, then biology. All of that is secondary to my preferences and my desires. The individual and not biology, according to this view, determines his own identity, his own gender. That's why there's over 50 genders recognized today. I find that incredible. Over 50 genders. I can think of XX and XY, and then I scratch my head, what are the other 48? And you know the goal is not 50, right? The goal is for there to be 7 billion genders. The goal is for every single individual to be their own unique gender. No boxes to check off. We're all whatever we want to be. And there's a ton of confusion. I do a talk on, on homosexuality and another talk on, on gender identity issues. And trust me, it's a world of, of ideology that's very confusing and very confused, but it comes down to this. You want big picture. It's what I want to show you today, big picture. When you elevate your feelings and your desires and your preferences above objective truth, then you get to define whatever you want to be, identity-wise. In this area, confusion is considered more than just a virtue. It's heroic. When somebody comes out as being confused about their gender, they're applauded for their valor and their courage. They're heroes. As long as somebody self-identifies as blank, nobody's going to dare to confront them with objective truth. On the contrary, everybody applauds the courage. The magic phrase that ends all debate is the phrase, I identify as. When you hear that phrase, that means shut up and don't give me your opinion. Discussion over. No room for debate. I identify as blank. You can watch videos. There's videos on, on YouTube of there's one apologist who goes to the University of Washington, here in Washington, and, and starts interviewing people. And he, 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 he wants, he's, it's him and his camera. He's five, nothing, short little guy, bearded, hairy guy, and he's got his cameraman, and he walks up to a group of students, and he wants to, you know, challenge them. He wants them to think 
you know, about this whole idea that how ridiculous it is to think that we all define and identify as whatever we want to identify as. So what does he do? He walks up to this group and he says, you know what? I identify as a seven-year-old Chinese girl. And the camera is rolling. And you see the reaction of the young people at the university. What their reaction is? It's a whatever. Cool. That's the reaction. There is no reaction. So he ups the ante a little bit. He says, well, let me go to another group and try something a little bit more harsh. So he goes to the next group and he says, you know what? I identify as a seven-year-old Chinese girl who measures seven feet tall. Seven feet tall. What's the reaction of the people? No reaction. He said the magic word, I identify as. So nobody will dare tell him, hey, the psychology department is right over there on campus. <laughs> Nobody's going to pull a mirror and say, have you ever seen yourself in a mirror? Here's, this is called a mirror. You're not Chinese, you're not a girl, and you're not seven feet tall. Nobody would do that because that's intolerant, hateful. You could be arrested for that in some places. So everybody just goes along. That's what happens when you elevate preferences and emotions above objective fact. You know what the objective facts are? You're born male or you're born female. That's it. That's the biology. And what I find really duplicitous here, what I find just hypocritical here is that sometimes a community will appeal to science when science is in agreement with them. But in this case, science is not on the same page. So for this particular issue, science is the bad guy. Whenever a scientist stands up for biology and says, this is what we know biologically, your chromosomes are male or female chromosomes, regardless of what you do to your body. You can mutilate your body. You can give yourself seven more eyes on your head. You're still a male or you're still a female. Your appearance doesn't change your chromosomes. When a scientist comes out with that, they could lose their jobs. They're sued. They're persecuted because science is wrong. How dare you tell, you, tell me what I am? So that's hypocritical. Either science knows what they're talking about or they're not. You can't use them for some things and then vilify them for others. And so you see that happen all the time. I won't, I won't elaborate more, but is identity a matter of preference? No. No, and be careful with the terminology. And I, I dig deeper into this when I do the talk on, on gender issues. Be careful with the terminology because the terminology has already changed. The, ex, the language has changed, and it's already been skewed in favor of this philosophy. So right now, when, when people talk about gender, they talk about gender assigned at birth. What? And that is the way to look it up. Look up any definition of any of the gender terms, and it's going to say it's, it's the same as or it's different to the gender assigned at birth. Where did that phrase come from? You're not assigned your gender at birth. If anything, we discover what it is at birth if you didn't discover it through an ultrasound. And your birth certificate is not what we label you. It's what you are. It's not something you are assigned. Well, it's not like, well, you're going to be an astronaut and you're going to be a doctor. No. It's, look, you have female genitalia or you have male genitalia. That determines what you are. You haven't been assigned this. Except by God, of course, at the moment of conception. So it, the terminology has changed. You've got to be really careful when we handle this. Now, please understand, I, I, I know that when, you, when we do talks like this, the danger is that it, I could come across as cold or callous or uncaring because I'm talking about truth about an issue and I'm not talking from an emotional position. But a few minutes ago, we talked about abortion. Abortion is wrong. But I have to caveat that by telling you, look, it's not an unpardonable sin. Many women have made that mistake. Many women have done that. And you know what? If you repent before God, you have forgiveness. It's not an unpardonable sin. And, and sometimes when a speaker speaks on these issues, he fails to recognize that there may be people hurting. 
in the audience that have already made these decisions and you can't take it back because you've already done it. So I want you to understand that I'm sensitive to that. I'm addressing the issue and the issue needs to be addressed in black and white, in truth and absolute truth as God has established it. And the same thing goes for the transgender issue. My heart breaks for kids that are confused about their identity. These are not horrible monsters. These are kids with good hearts and kind kids that are confused. They look at themselves in the mirror and they don't like what they see. They see the body of a man, but they feel like a woman inside. It's a real battle in their minds. And we can't belittle that and we can't demonize them and we can't make them into monsters because they're not. They're legitimate, loving human beings who are struggling with a problem. Now, it's still true that they don't determine who, what their gender is. Those are just facts. But let us, I, I don't want to come across as insensitive to these issues because I'm not. I'm very sensitive. As a matter of fact, I have a huge outreach to the gay and the trans community. And I've dealt with a lot of people. I've let, God has let me lead people to Christ in those communities. And so I, I, I'm careful to make this, this, this clarification when I say these things. But it doesn't change the truth. And the truth is that we don't define who we are in gender. We are born male or we are born female, regardless of how we feel about it. And so that's the truth. And the confusion comes when we try to elevate our preferences above truth. There's a lot of confusion about objective truth and what it means. People don't even understand what truth is in our culture. We live in a post-truth world and emotions and preferences, they don't define truth real well. They don't. By elevating our feelings and our emotions above objective truth, what we're doing is it's, it's evidence of a deep-seated confusion about the very nature of truth itself. We affirm with that all truth is a matter of preferences, and in doing so, we're ignoring the whole field of objective truths. That is a reality in the world we live in. As a matter of fact, we affirm objectively that objective truths don't exist. When you say objective truths don't exist, that is an objective truth you're making. So you, you can't possibly sustain it. It's self-defeating all the way around. What people fail to understand today is that there are two types of truth statements, two types of truth claims. There's objective truth based on the object itself, not on feelings or thoughts on the subject. And there's subjective truth based on thoughts or feelings about a subject, not about the object. Let me highlight the difference here. If I show you this haagen Dulce de Leche ice cream, Dulce de Leche ice cream is the best ice cream ever, ever, hands down. That's why they have Pop-Tarts of Dulce de Leche, syrup, Oreos, healthy choice, shakes. And if you haven't tried it, you, you, you might disagree. But once you try it, forget it. That is the best ice cream ever. Now, what kind of a truth is that? What kind of a truth claim is that? Subjective. I'm giving you my opinion. I'm not saying anything about the ice cream. I'm telling everything about how I feel about the ice cream. And I happen to love it, and I happen to think it's the best one. But you might think another ice cream is the best one. Rocky Road or whatever, Heavenly Hash or Napoleon, I don't know. You, know. you might have another favorite flavor. And you know what? It's okay because God made us that way. Some of us like, you know, fruits and some of us don't. Some of us like vegetables and some of us don't. You know, and even within the vegetables, some of us like tomatoes and some of us don't. And some of us like spinach and others don't. We're all different that way and it's okay. There are things that fall into the category of preferences. Nothing wrong with that. The problem we have in our culture today is when we say that everything falls into the category of preferences. And that's where we run into problem because everything doesn't fall into that category. God is not like an ice cream flavor that some may think he exists and for others he doesn't. No, he either exists or he doesn't and what you feel about it makes no difference. It doesn't change reality. That's objective truth supersedes anyone's opinion. And if I were to do something, an objective truth with the ice cream, I would tell you everything about this ice cream and then I would say, and by the way, it's good for diabetes. Don't take my word for this. This is not true, okay? I don't want that on my conscience. If you're diabetic, don't go buy this ice cream because I don't want you to have a seizure on me, okay? It's not good for diabetes. But 
the point is when I make a statement like that, it's good for diabetes. That is either true or not based on the ice cream's effect on the human body. And it's not a matter of opinion. If you agree with it or disagree with it, it's irrelevant. Because I'm saying something about the ice cream, not about how I feel about it. And we need to be able to distinguish between these two things. And the best way to argue, when somebody tells you there are no objective truths, I mean, there's two ways to respond to that. The first one is ask him, is that true? Because it seems to me like you're giving me an objective truth to tell me there aren't any. And if, it, if it's not true, then why are you telling me this? The other way to respond to it is give him a counterexample. What if I show you something that is objectively true? Meaning it's true for everybody, everywhere, at all times, and it doesn't change regardless of how anybody feels about it. If I give you an example, will you believe that there are objective truths? How about this one? Two apples and two apples is four apples. That's objectively true. In every country, in every planet, in every place in the world, to every person that has ever existed, that is a true statement. Now, if you grew up in a world, in a, in, a, in a culture that believed that two apples and two apples was five, your culture was wrong. If you grew up in a country and your parents and your grandparents and everybody in your family thinks that two apples and two apples is three apples, everyone in your family is wrong. If you hate the number four, it's still four. That's the nature of objective truth. If you had never been born, it would still be four apples. And that's where you figure that, you know what, it's not a matter of opinion because my opinion is irrelevant. If I had never been born, it would still be true. And God and his word and, and, and the truth of Christianity, these are objective truths. Either the God of the Bible exists or he doesn't, and it's not a matter of opinion. Either the Bible is God's word or it's not, and it's not a matter of opinion. Either Jesus Christ is Lord or he's not, and it's not a matter of opinion. Either Jesus rose from the dead or he didn't, and it's not a matter of opinion. These fundamental truths of Christianity are not like an ice cream flavor. You don't get to choose if it's true for you and true for me. Not true for me. It either is true or it's not. And through apologetics and through many talks, we can prove that all of those statements are objectively true. And so that confusion is part of the huge, the big problem we have in our, in our society today. When you hear people say, well, that's true for you, but not for me. Huh? Well, if, 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 if I say dulce leche ice cream is the best ice cream in the world, you're welcome to say that. But if I tell you God exists, you can't say that. You can say, I don't think he exists. I believe you're wrong. But that's your opinion. And he exists or he doesn't exist even if you didn't exist. And that's the bottom line. So truth is not a matter of preference, guys. It's not. Truth just is. And I want to end with a confusion about morality because this is important. What, when you elevate your feelings and your emotions and your preferences above truth, when you enthrone these preferences, then guess what? You can do and you can be whatever you want. That's why morality, moral confusion is a virtue today. It's one, another one of those virtues. People that are not morally confused are very black and white and narrow-minded. You should be morally confused. That's what makes you awesome as a human being in our culture today. Moral clarity that shows the objective truth beyond our preferences, the boundaries and the limits we ought to conform to, that's a no-no. Don't talk about that. That's a vice. How dare you tell me how to live my life? How dare you set these problems? Who are you to determine that? And my answer is I'm not anyone to determine that. But God is. And he is who can determine that. Our autonomy allows us to determine what is right and wrong and nobody has a right to object. I want to show you an interview that was done of a young man on a college campus and just walk through you with it for a few minutes. This interview is powerful because it is a young person telling you what moral confusion looks like. You're going to hear it. You're going to see it. And I wish I could tell you that this is like a unique guy that we found somewhere that's so strange we filmed him. No. This is what young people today are thinking. And if you don't believe me, I challenge youth pastors and pastors all the time. I challenge them. Get your youth group together 
give them an anonymous survey, no names, so there's no consequences, and ask them to please be honest. And you, all you have to give them is, you can ask more questions, but there's one question that's going to put this one clear for you. Ask them one true or false question. One true or false question. Here's the question. Everyone decides for themselves what is right and wrong. True or false? You're going to find that most of the young people in your youth group will pick true as the answer. Why? Because that's what they, the culture has taught them. They've already understood this. They've already bought into this. In churches, that is the case across the country. I see that in a lot of churches. There's always the sharp, smart kids that are in God's word, that have been taught right, that when they get this survey, they say, oh, that's false. Of course we don't determine that. God does. But that's not the majority. That's a very small minority of youth. This is a real issue. But listen to this young man, and we'll unpack his confusion. So your name was again? Ben. Ben, okay. Ben, my name's Chad. So Ben, you don't believe in right and wrong? No. And why is that? It's purely subjective. I mean, it's never really straight up and down, if that makes any sense. That's kind of the best way I could explain it. So when you think of something like torturing babies for the fun of it, you can't say that's black and white wrong? You, you say I that it's, 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 it's open? I say it's cruel. But I mean, like, torturing babies for the fun of it, you should be stopped. I don't believe in right or wrong, but I would stop you if I saw you doing it. Okay. Let's unpack some of that confusion here for us, okay? Ben, do you believe in right and wrong? No. No hesitation. In other words, there is no objective morality. Objective right and wrong does not exist. That's a, that's a flat-out no. Why is that? Well, he goes back and forth, but his conclusion is it's purely subjective. Very clear statements. In other words, it's purely a matter of opinion. Now, what does the, 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 uh, the apologist do is he gives him a counterexample to challenge him a little bit. Let me give you an example that shows how untrue what you just said is to see if I can get you to react. And he says, well, so you think that something like torturing babies for the fun of it you can't say that's black and white wrong. You say it's like open, optional. It's a matter of preference. <clears throat> Think about that question for a minute. If you believe that morality is relative, how do you answer that question? If you're going to be consistent with your relativism, your answer is going to be, well, yeah. I wouldn't do it, but if somebody else thinks it's right for them to do it, they should have the right to do it. What? That's where you should go with that. Of course he doesn't go there because we don't think that way. We can't be consistent in a moral relativistic way. So what does he say? Well, I say it's cruel. Now we're playing semantic games. I don't believe in right and wrong, but I believe in cruel. Wait a minute. Cruel is like wrong, but really, really, really wrong. Like wrong on steroids, that's cruel. So you don't believe in wrong, but you believe in cruel? We're playing word games here. You should be stopped. I don't believe in right and wrong, but I would try to stop you if I saw you doing it. Why? Why would you try to stop me? Didn't you just say that it's purely subjective? If you don't want to torture babies, don't do it. But why would you try to stop me? I thought everybody decided for themselves what's right and wrong. And if I decide this is right, why would you try to stop me? That's inconsistent. Doesn't make any sense. So the interviewer asked him in the next clip, well, why would you try to stop him? And neither one of us has any more truth value than the other? Essentially. Just yes or no? Yes. So your truth value, your opinion, has no more weight or bearing than a child molester's or a rapist? They still believe what they believe, you know? Hmm. Okay, things get interesting. So... Ben, neither one, you believe that neither one of us has any more truth value than the other, right? That means that whatever you think is true is just as valuable as whatever I think is true. Whatever you think is right is just as valuable as whatever I think is right, regardless of what it is. And he says, well, essentially, no, 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 that's not a, that's not a good answer. Do you believe that's the case? Yes or no? Yes, yes, of course I do. Everybody's truth value is equal. Man, that's a huge statement. Now here comes a counterexample. So your truth value, your opinion, has no more weight or bearing than a child molester's or a rapist? 
Well, if you put it that way, and his answer is, they still believe what they believe. He didn't answer the question. The question is, do you believe that a child molester and a rapist moral truth is just as valuable as your moral truth? He didn't answer it. He says, well, they still believe what they believe. Uh, the question was, though, you believe by your standard that their moral opinion is just as valuable, not any less valuable, than yours. and has just as much weight. Yeah, they're still human beings. Everybody has their... Everybody has their right to have their moral opinion. Now, the rest of the human race and the rest of the world, maybe even the rest of the universe, nature itself, may try to stop that because it's something that goes against, you know, how do I word this, the well-being of everything around it. But I still think they're entitled to do that. Just like, and I, they're going to tape this, and I'm probably going to regret saying this, but I have to, just like I think Hitler's entitled to do what he did, but I still would have fought against him. Why would you fight against him? I don't agree with the taking, just, I don't believe in genocide. It's too, it's like, it's just like, you know, the right versus wrong. It's like saying, because you're you, you're wrong. Okay. And just kind of going back on what you're saying though, that's only your opinion, mm -hmm. and your opinion ultimately has no more value than a child molesters or a rapist. Pretty much. Isn't there something within you that just kind of screams, this is just wrong, but I can't explain it from my worldview? Okay, this is getting more interesting, and the confusion is growing. Okay, so you believe you, by your standard that their moral opinion, the rapists and the child molesters, is just as valuable, not any less valuable than yours. It just has, it has just as much weight. Yeah, they're still human beings. Everybody has a right to have their moral opinion. Now, this is super interesting. If you're a child molester or the rapist, the rest of the human race and the rest of the world, maybe even the rest of the universe and nature itself may try to stop you. Now, why, if, if something is of a nature that the whole human race would try to stop you, would that not be categorized as wrong? I don't know. If nature, the universe, and the human race all want to stop you, man, there must be something wrong with what you're doing, I'm, I mean, I'm guessing, right? And then how do you justify that? Why would they try to stop it? He says, uh, nature may try to stop that because it's something that goes against, you know, he's about to say a moral objective truth, but he can't because he doesn't believe in them. So he's like, well, how do I word this? Uh, well, it goes against uh, the well-being of everyone around, of everything around it. But I still, I still think they're entitled to do it. Really? You think a rapist and a child molester are entitled to do what they do? Wow. You know, I, but you know how he sleeps at night? Because he says to himself, but I would try to stop it. Which is completely inconsistent with his worldview. That shows you the level of confusion. Then he takes it an, up a notch. Just like I think Hitler is entitled to do what he did, but I would have fought against him. Think about the implications of that, of that statement. Hitler was entitled to do what he did. You know he didn't make this up, right? You know that this is what he's taught. History and sociology departments in many universities today, this is what they talk about. Who are we to judge Hitler? Hitler did what he thought was best for Germany, and who are we to judge him? He was entitled to do whatever he thought would be best for his country. And kids are convinced that that is the case. Yeah, who are we to judge Hitler? He was entitled to do whatever he felt was best for his country. No, that's not the way it works. You're not entitled to slaughter millions of people in gas chambers. You're not entitled to kill people like cattle. That's no one's entitlement. But if that's what you're taught and that's what you believe, then you regurgitate it and that's what you just heard. And then he says, Chad asked him, well, why would you fight against them? Again, because that's the key. If everybody decides for themselves right and wrong, then you have no right to challenge anybody or fight anybody on it. Just don't do it yourself if you don't like it. But let everybody be, because everybody has a right. Everybody's entitled. He says, well, I don't agree with... He almost said another moral truth. 
I don't believe in genocide. Okay, good. Don't commit any genocide. But why would you try to stop him? Because he believes in it. See, at the end of the day, that's just your belief. He says, going back on what you're saying, though, that's only your opinion. And your opinion ultimately has no more value than a child molester or a rapist. Pretty much. Now he goes in for a close because he's given up enough to think about. And he says, well, listen, isn't there something within you that kind of screams, this is just wrong, but I can't explain it from my worldview? And he's not ready to give in yet. He says, nope. Last clip. Here we go. Chad is not giving up on him. Chad is going to challenge him again. And this time he's going to unpack it a little more to see if he can get him to admit what is happening in his mind. Because it's already, he's already, his mind is reeling. He's not making sense of his own view. So the, the, the apology is trying to get him to take that next step and say, you know what, maybe, maybe there's something wrong with the way I'm thinking. Here we go. Isn't there something within you that just says raping and child molesting isn't only subjectively wrong, it's not just wrong because that's my opinion, but it's absolutely wrong. But with my worldview, I just can't explain that somehow. Is that sort of the conundrum that you're in? Hmm. Something along those lines. That's a win. That's a win. That's a concession. That's a, you know what? Yeah. You kind of make sense. That's what it comes down to. Isn't there something within you that just says that raping and child molesting is, sub, is on, not only subjectively wrong, it's wrong because, not just wrong because it's your opinion, but it's absolutely wrong. But with your worldview, you can't explain it somehow. Is that kind of the conundrum you're in? Mm, after much thought, yeah, something along those lines. You see, if you don't see it with your own eyes, you might not believe when I tell you the amount of moral confusion that our young people are facing today because we've taken away the priority of truth and we've subordinated truth under the priority of emotions and personal preferences. And when you elevate your emotions and your personal preferences above truth, that's the kind of confusion you get. He was contradicting himself back and forth and his view could not be more incoherent and inconsistent than it is because truth has been relegated to the outskirts of what's important. So is morality a matter of preference? Absolutely not. So it, let, let, me, let me take you to wrap up in some conclusions here that are important. If you don't take anything today, take this from this seminar. What is the danger of relativism? Let me show you how the enemy comes in through the back door. Because I think the church and Christianity has done a fairly good job at closing the front door. Locking it, bolting it, and putting an alarm. You're not going to come in the front door. So what does the enemy do? He finds a window or a back door to get in. He's, that's what he does. He's a thief. He came to steal, kill, and destroy. Let me show you how cunning his strategy is. But you know what? When you know his strategy, when you know the truth, it'll set you free. It'll keep you free from deception. Here's the danger of relativism. Relativism makes sin disappear. Magically. Think about that for a minute. Because if everybody does what they determine for themselves is right, then nobody's doing anything wrong. Nobody's sinning. Because who decides what's right and wrong? I do. And so if I do whatever I do, it's going to be right because I decide that it's right. Sin is wiped off the slate in the discussion. And if you don't, if there is no sin, there's no need for redemption. If I haven't sinned, I don't need to be forgiven. If I haven't done anything wrong, I don't need to be forgiven. I don't need to be forgiven for doing what I think is right. And if there is no need for redemption, then the cross of Christ is unnecessary. You see what the enemy just did? He rendered the cross of Christ unnecessary. How? By getting young people to believe that you can do whatever you want. You can choose for yourself what's right and wrong. And in, in making that decision, that's an easy decision for a young person to make. Do you want a list of things you can and cannot do or do you want to make your own list? 
Who in their right mind would not want to make their own list? Like I tell kids in school, and I do, and I do, when I talk about these issues in school, I tell the kids, how many of you would like to make up your own school schedule? Kids that go to public schools. They would all love it. What would the schedule look like if you made the schedule? Well, school start, starts at around 11.30, so I can sleep in the morning. Uh, we have lunch, P.E., and then we're dismissed three days a week. That's what school would look like if you made your own rules. So the enemy gets young people to buy into this idea of make your own rules. When he wins that battle, the cross of Christ has been negated. Because now you don't sin anymore. And if you don't sin, you don't need to be forgiven. And if you don't need to be forgiven, why did Christ die on a cross? That is the danger of relativism. That's why we need to face this head on. That's why we need to be clear about this. So how do we know if something is right and wrong? How do we know? C.S. Lewis said, my argument against God was that the universe seemed to be cruel and unjust. But how had I got this idea of just and unjust? A man doesn't call a line crooked unless he has some idea of a straight line. What was I comparing the universe with when I called it unjust? You see what he just said? A man cannot call a line crooked unless he has an idea of what a straight line looks like. That is profound wisdom there. What is our straight line? What's the standard of all truth? Our straight line is the, God, the word of God. You know if something is good or bad, right or wrong, because you go and compare it to God's word. What does God's word say? That's the straight line, because that is what God is telling us is right and wrong. If it conforms to the word of God, it's good. If it's against the word of God, it's wrong. If God approves it, it's good. If God disapproves of it, it's wrong. Period. That's the straight line. That's how you know what's right and wrong. Ask God. Look at his word. Blas Pascal, I told you, Blaise, I told you in the previous talk that I would, I would mention this quote from him. When he talked about this, he says, when everyone is moving at once, no one appears to be moving. Like on board a ship. Of course, that was the fastest method of transportation in his day. I would say today it would be comparable to like a plane. You know that when you're going on an airplane, you're going 500 miles an hour. The coffee is going 500 miles an hour. The flight attendant is going 500 miles an hour. Everything, and, and nothing seems to be moving. But you want to know how you can find out right away that everything is moving? Take any one object on the plane and stop it from going 500 miles an hour. What's going to happen? Everything else is just going to fly on. And that's going to stick out like a sore thumb. Because it did not continue to move. And that's what he's saying. He says, when everyone is moving towards depravity, no one seems to be moving. But if someone stops, he shows up the others who are rushing on by acting as a fixed point. Powerful words by Pascal. We need to be that fixed point that does what God, the word of God says. And that way, all the debauchery and all the sinfulness of people rushing by towards depravity becomes obvious because you're standing still. Paul said that to the Corinthians. Paul said to the Corinthians, you know what's going to happen? When you stop sinning with your friends, they're going to hate you for it. They're going to hate you for it. Because now, all of a sudden, hey, let's all go party. We're going to go, you know, tear it up. And you say, no, I'm not going. I don't, I don't think that's the right thing to do. Ooh, how do you think that makes everybody else feel? Like lower than scum. Chopped liver. They go, oh, excuse me, Mr. Holy. I didn't realize I was dealing with St. John here. It, why? Because when you stand firm, all of a sudden, the, the people rushing to depravity, it becomes obvious. We have to be that fixed point. And where do we get the morality to stand on to be that fixed point? Again, our fixed point is the Word of God. That's where we stand on. And that's what we don't move from. That's why the Word of God says in, in, in the book of, uh, of Psalms, it says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, 
nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by rivers of water that brings forth his fruit in season, whose leaf shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. In a world where everybody's doing the wrong thing, blessed is the man who doesn't do the wrong thing. In a world where people are confused about freedom, blessed is the man who's not confused. In a world where people are confused about the value and the dignity of human life, blessed is the man who's not confused. In a world where people are, are, are confused about the nature of morality, blessed is the man who is not confused. The man who's standing firm on the fixed point of God's word. The man who takes the straight line of God's word and tries to line up his life to that. He is the blessed man. Everybody, This world tells you that everyone makes their own road to their own destiny and you do what you want. It's not what the Word of God says. The Word of God says there are many, many ways, but there's only one way. There is a straight, direct path to God the Father. And it's only one road that you can be on that'll get you to God the Father, and that's Jesus Christ. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the way. Nobody gets to the Father unless they're on my road. And they're taking me as the way to God. That's why the psalmist continues to say, the ungodly, they're not like that. They're like the shaft which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the ways of the righteous, but the ways of the ungodly shall perish. Why are we blessed when we do things the way we ought to? Because we will have eternal life. Why are they cursed for doing the wrong thing? Because they will perish. They will not enter the kingdom of God. Clear as day. So what are the implications of living in the world in a world with objective morality? What are the implications? The implications are simple. God exists. If there is a moral law, there's a moral law giver. And that's God. And if God exists, where does that leave me? I have a problem, Houston. If God exists, I have a problem. I'm guilty. Because I'm not living up to the standard he has established for me. That is the human dilemma. God exists, therefore mor there's morality, objective morality. I'm not living by that code, so I am guilty of violating God's law. And he is a righteous judge. And I have to stand before that righteous judge. That's where the gospel becomes relevant to the world we live in. How do we rescue people? How do we rescue a society that has lost truth? We need to confront them with a dilemma, the human dilemma. That's the dilemma. And the solution to that, the human dilemma, is the cross of Christ. That is the solution to the dilemma. Yes, we are guilty. But God made a way. God made a way. God stepped into human history to save us from ourselves, to redeem us from our miserable state of fallenness. And Isaiah invites everyone to make that decision. In the book of Isaiah, God says, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. That is the gospel. That is the only way to save truth in a world that has lost it. We need to be the beacons of truth. We need to be the lighthouse. We need to be the light and the salt of the world. We need to be standing up firm for the truth. Objective truth. God exists. His word is true. He tells us how we need to live our lives and he tells us the only way we're going to get to heaven through Jesus Christ. If we don't stand up for truth, who's going to do it? Ask yourself, is anybody out there going to stand up for truth? No. It takes the church being the church and Christians being bold about their faith. So my challenge to you is to be bold. Be bold in love, with reverence and fear, with meekness and fear with gentleness and respect, but be bold when you give an answer for the reason and for the hope that we have. 
So I've shown you today why God makes sense in a world that doesn't. Because a world without God is a horrible place to live. Life without God is meaningless, purposeless, and valueless. We saw that. God makes sense in a world that doesn't because this world doesn't make sense. Why? Because they've abandoned truth and replaced it with personal preferences. Big picture. Hopefully this opens our eyes and we can see why things are as messed up as they are. Because people have elevated preferences above truth. And only God can make sense in a world like that. Only the truth of God's word makes things real and makes sense. C.S. Lewis once said, I don't have it here, but he said, I believe in Christianity like I believe the sun has risen. Great analogy. He says, not only because I see the sun, but because of the sun, I can see everything else. What was he saying? Sunlight allows me to see clearly everything I have in front of me. Christianity is like turning on the lights in a dark room. All of a sudden, you can see things the way they are. Only through God can you see the world the way it really is. That's why God makes sense in a world that doesn't. Thanks so much for listening to this talk as well. I know you guys have been patient. You've been sitting for a long time. But it's important for us to grasp these concepts and have a bigger picture of what is really happening in the world around us. Something that will help us tie together all those loose ends and all those dots and connect all the dots that we see that just don't make sense. So I'm going to take a few minutes now and we'll do some Q&A. And I'm going to ask uh, Brother Heinz to come up and he's going to help us with that. And, and honestly, let, let's, if you have concerns, questions, things you, you want to clarify, I'll do my best to answer them. And because I, I want us to walk out of here today equipped, better equipped to face a world that has lost truth altogether. Okay, well, well let's uh, thank um, Juan for the presentation. And we'll take 15 minutes for Q&A. So if you have a question, raise your hand and I'll come around. I'm just curious if this is a problem in other countries, um, European countries, uh, Uganda, Ethiopia, Tanzania. Are you seeing the same things? Because I know you're a world traveler. And how was this influenced influencing the people, how was that brought about? Because I could see this happening in America just because of our selfishness. Um, but I don't see that being played out in third world countries. So have you seen this same pattern in other countries? That's a phenomenal question. Thank you for asking that question. It's a really good question. He, here's what we, what would we expect if we were looking at this purely rationally? We would expect this to be only an American problem or only a problem of the first world where there's richness and there's all this, uh, where, where, where people are spoiled and everything is easy. But when you look at it with your spiritual eyes, you would realize that it's the same enemy that's deceiving us is at work in the entire planet deceiving everybody. So Europe has been post-truth for a lot longer than we have. Europe has been post-God, post-theistic for almost a century. So they are way ahead of us in this lostness. Objective truth in Europe is practically non-existent. So it happens there. Now every continent is different. The continent of Africa has been influenced by spirit spiritism and a lot of the spiritual cults for such a long time that it's been harder to break into them for the enemy, I'm saying, and to get there to change their way of life. But these global agendas have a way of making it in. Let me tell you how. World health organizations, that are, there are various, there's not just one, there's various world health organizations and foundations that pour millions and billions of dollars into the third world but it comes with strings attached. 
And so, yes, we're going to come to Tanzania and we're going to come to Ghana and we're going to come to Kenya and we're going to bring millions of dollars in aid to fight disease, to fight this. But you got to legalize abortion. Because, you know, every woman has a right to choose. Or else, no money. That's happening in, in, in almost the whole entire planet, all third world countries. I was talking to a senator, a, a lady senator that was recently elected in Costa Rica. And I met her and I, she, she went to one of the talks. She was driving and she heard on the radio the topics and she said, man, this would be interesting. She's a Christian. So she drove in. I didn't know who she was. She was sitting in the crowd. She listened to a talk. She invited me to her office. And she says, look, here's the dilemma we're facing in Costa Rica. This was two years ago. Here's the dilemma we're facing in Costa Rica. This national health organization and this national monetary fund is threatening Costa Rica with not giving us any more aid if we don't legalize abortion. And the Costa Rican people don't want to legalize it. The government doesn't want to legalize it. The people on the streets don't want it. We value life. But we're between a rock and a hard place. Because the president has told us, hey, I don't care what you do, make it happen because we need the funds. And so this is what the Senate is fighting. This is what is happening. The enemy doesn't play fair. He doesn't fight fair. So we see this happening in Africa. We see this happening in Latin America. The, the LGBT movement is sweeping the world with tremendous momentum. Even though it finds a lot of resistance, it's still penetrating a lot of cultures. So the confusion is worldwide. It's global. Some places are far more conservative than the rest of the world. And some places have been able to resist it a lot. But it's a very minute group of people. And the Church of Christ, our church, the church, the body of Christ, is the common denominator in resisting this movement throughout the planet. So the church is being challenged and persecuted in many places because of it. Thank you for that question. It's a phenomenal question. I didn't quite catch where uh, you said we should go on our phone and do 51555. I'm just not sure what to do next. Okay. I scratched out stuff. I put it back on the screen. So we do stable creation? Yes. The, the, the number you're going to text to is 51555. Five, five, five. And uh -huh. the message you're going to send yeah. is the message, stay bold, space, creation. Okay. I got and it. then you're going to get a text back on your phone with a link to fill out the form. My name and email. Yep. Okay. Other questions over out here? here? There's a question over here. I thought I had changed it. I just had it on a different slide. My bad. Thanks for your talk today, Juan. You're welcome. Um, so a question I have is, I know people that would agree with objective truth. So like your statement, two plus two is four, or you know, the false one, ice cream is good for diabetes. So how would you reply when someone would, would agree with that but then would say, well, you know, I think ice cream is bad for diabetes, but if I don't think about it, maybe it kind of won't apply. Or, you know, if I, if I just don't think about two plus two being four, if I just don't think about it, maybe it will kind of be three. It, it's kind of, it's like a magical thinking. If I don't think about something, objective reality doesn't maybe apply. And how do you penetrate thinking like that? Great question. Thank you for your question. We, I run across that mentality more often than I'd like. <laughs> but it is, it is something that occurs. It even occurs in Christian circles. It occurs in Christian circles when people say, well, uh, if, if, I, if I confess that I'm not sick, then I'm not sick. If I think that I'm not sick, then I'm not going to be really sick. It's the power of thinking, positive thinking, that somehow it's going to negate reality. Uh, my typical way of approaching that is simple. Is that we're trying not to be condescending. It's hard. 
It's hard not to be sarcastic. But we need to be loving and we need to be persuasive. And my, my typical loving approach to that is, listen, I understand why you don't want it to be the case. I understand why you don't want there to be a hell. I understand why you don't want there to be condemnation. I understand why this or that. But understand this. That is a reality that's not affected by the way we feel about it. Because if we had never been born, there would still either be a hell or not. If we had never been born, we would, I mean, whatever it is that they're trying to be wishful thinkers about is not affected by the way we think. If my car is a blue Honda and you think that it's not and you don't even think about it and somehow you want to make it believe it's a Ford Bronco, I mean, all the thinking in the world is not going to change reality. And so the idea is to try to persuade somebody to say, look, wishful thinking can only take us so far. We have to be realist. We have to know what reality is. We live in a real world, not in an imaginary world. And this real world has real characteristics and real traits. And if we don't embrace the truth, we're going to lie to ourselves. And at the end of the day, we're going to pay a stiff price for not getting it right. There's too much at stake for me to be wishing things away. I need to confront reality. And that, that not everybody can tolerate it. Some people do this as a defense mechanism because they can't handle thinking of reality in its full weight. And I also understand that. And we we sympathize and we, depending on what is being questioned, if it's something that's not critical to salvation, then, you know, we can be gentler. If their soul is at risk, we need to be more bold and make sure that we, they get it right. Okay, a few other questions out there. Yeah, you, uh, you know, w we can have questions on other apologetics issues as well, not just what he covered here. Uh, thanks for the talk, Juan. Um, how would you, what have you found to be the most effective way of presenting the gospel to somebody who thinks that they have a male brain in a female body or a female brain in a male body? I think that, first of all, there has to be relationship. You can't speak truth into somebody with whom you don't have a relationship. You don't have the right. They would not give you the right to speak truth to them. And any attempt to it, do it would be seen as, you know, transphobic and all that other stuff. Uh, the first step is to build a relationship. The second step is to acknowledge the feelings. It is true that you feel this way. Sometimes we negate what a person is feeling and it's the most ludicrous thing. How can you tell me that I'm not feeling this? I'm the one feeling it. So we, we have to acknowledge and try to understand, be, be empathetic, understand, walk in their shoes, understand what they're thinking. Try to imagine looking at the world from their perspective. The more understanding you are, the closer you are to a breakthrough with them. All this to say, it's not a simple, easy, two-step process. It takes time. You have to invest time in it. But in conversation, the goal is to get a person to realize that there is something called reality, a real world, the way things really are. And then there's something called desires, the way we wish the world was. And getting them to understand those two categories of, of, of existence is important because when you're able to distinguish between what reality is and what I wish it were and what I desire it were, then it's easier to say, look, all the wishing in the world doesn't change this. This is just a fact. And that's a very difficult step for a trans person to, to take because they feel that all the happiness that they haven't had in their life is finally within reach when they finally transition to the next gender. All their hope and all their wishes are in that next step. 
And then what do the statistics show? And I, I've sat down some, with some people and showed them the studies. Look, these are not Christian studies. These are secular institutions making studies. John Hopkins University, the United uh, Health Industry in, in Britain. The, these are studies that are being made. And the studies show that people that undergo gender transition surgery increase the risk of suicide by 300%. Why? It's easy to make the connection of the dots here. Because all your eggs were in that basket. You thought that this would finally make you happy. And at the end of the day, you realize that you now look like a female, but you still feel like a male. You're still a male. You can't get rid of that. And so you're not happy. And there's nothing else to do. What else can I do to be happy? Nothing else. So I may as well just end my life. It's so sad. That is why John Hopkins which is the first hospital in the United States to do the gender op surgeries, was also the first hospital to, to stop doing it. And the director of the program who started it was the same director who stopped it. And you, he's online, and you can find his interviews and his material, and he's online saying, look, we stopped doing it because we realized that we were mutilating healthy bodies but we were not changing gender. We now would have a male with a mutilated body that looked like a female body, but every chromosome in his body is still a male chromosome. And we saw that this was not bringing anybody any joy or any happiness. On the contrary, it increased the death rate amongst that community incredibly by suicide. So we no longer want to do that. We're hurting people, we're not helping them. Now, he almost got fired and he became the, he's been sued by I don't know how many, the whole LGBT community has gone after him for being honest. But he's a medical doctor and he's telling it like it is. So you have these discussions. It helps sometimes with different people. You might get him to see uh, Walt Heyer. Walt Heyer has uh, videos. He was trans and then got saved and, 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 and tried to transition back into the gender God gave him. He wrote a book about it. He's interviewed many people who've gone through this process. And these, in, these books are powerful. Uh, I can give you the, after, after we're done, I can show you, I can, I, in, the, in the car I have in my suitcase, a couple of books. I can show you the names of the books. These are, if you know somebody you want to work with, these books would be really helpful because you're hearing it from their perspective and understanding it. And I think... I've offered it to some people, and some people have taken the books, and some people said, no, no, I don't want to see that. Because they, again, they, they want to wish it away. They don't want to deal with reality. But it's a long process, but it's doable. And undergirding all of that is prayer. Prayer, prayer, because it's the Holy Spirit is the one that convicts and converts. We have to pray that the Holy Spirit would use us, that our words would be the words that would make a difference in this person's life. And you have to be patient, and you've got to be willing to take you know, some abuse and, and some mistreatment and still love the person through, the, through that. Say, look, you're mad at me. I know why you're saying this, but I'm not mad at you. I love you and I want to I help you. So you can call me whatever name you want. I can add some names to that list and give to you that you can call me those names too. But it doesn't change the fact that I want to help you. You have to be there for them. And it has to be real. I hope that helps. Okay, other questions you might have? You know, anything to do with apologetics and if not, um, I'm going to bring this to an end. Uh, Juan, I'm going to ask you to close in a word of prayer after I make a few announcements, if you would. And Amen. Yeah, just to remind you that the, he's given two more talks um, on the weekend, um, and both of them are at 6 p.m. at two different churches. Um, tonight... There's a talk on uh, five reasons why I am not an atheist, and that's going to be at Calvary Chapel in Marysville. And then the, the other one is on addressing re relative uh, morality, which uh, Juan was alluding to here earlier as well. And that's going to be at uh, Emmanuel Baptist Church in um, Snow Homish, which is not too far from here. Both of them at 6 o'clock. Thank you. Remember the book on your way out? 
If you buy the book, you're going to be especially blessed. Not just kidding. But <laughs> it would really help somebody. And so I, I think it's a good tool. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for, for being who you are, for loving us in spite of ourselves. Thank you for being patient, Lord, with this world that you've created and, and with the rebellious heart of man. Father God, we are these little peons trying to be important and trying to challenge your authority and trying to be God and usurp your throne, Father God. And, and, and Father God, we are so ill-equipped and so unworthy, Lord, but thank you for Jesus Christ. Thank you for loving us in spite of ourselves. While we were yet sinners, Lord, you paid the ultimate price for us. Father, I pray that if anyone does not know you, that these talks would push them and nudge them a little closer to trusting you for their salvation, to coming to know the reason why we have meaning in our lives, the reason why we have purpose and why we have value. I pray, Lord, that, that, that as Christians, everyone here would stay bold. I pray that we would stand up for truth. I pray that we would not lose sight of a dying, lost world that needs us to share the gospel with them, that needs us to throw them that lifeline that they may not perish. Thank you for everyone here, all the families represented, all the young people. I pray, Lord, that they would grasp these ideas, that they would be seeds well planted that will bear fruit in their hearts. And I bless the ministry of Apologetics Forum and all of the people involved and all the hard work they're doing, Father God, to be bold and to stand up and to provide resources and, and talks about these issues, Father God. When so many people are neglecting these topics, it's refreshing, Lord, to see those that are being truth, truthful to your word and committed to the truth. I pray a blessing over this church for opening its doors. And, and Lord, may we have a wonderful afternoon, whatever our plans are for this afternoon. And uh, give us a good night tonight as well at the church we'll be at this afternoon. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.